Hi, everyone, here and around the world. Since last week's podcast about tall white extraterrestrials and their allies, Nordic extraterrestrials, we've received more than 400 comments and messages from you all about some of your experiences. And in a few minutes, I'm going to share some important comments from a military aerospace source that contacted me after last week's podcast. But first, today, April 19th, 2023, the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee's Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee held a new hearing on unidentified aerial phenomena, also known as UAP UFOs. And this is only the second congressional hearing in more than 50 years about UFO UAPs after a very feeble hearing last May of 2022. The only person called to speak before today's Senate subcommittee hearing is the co-author of a recent five-page academic paper entitled Physical Constraints on Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. The paper featured in this Politico April 14, 2023 article last week hypothesizes that the Amuamua extraterrestrial object after its rapid travel through our solar system in September to October of 2017 might have been an extraterrestrial scout craft. The co-authors are Sean Kirkpatrick, Ph.D., head of the Pentagon's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, also known by the acronym ARO, who collaborated with Harvard professor of astronomy Avi Loeb, Ph.D. Professor Loeb was the first scientist to propose the strangely shaped and accelerating object, quote, could potentially be a parent craft that releases many small probes during its close passage to Earth, meaning a muamua could have been a scout ship for an extraterrestrial civilization checking up on our solar system with many small probes. The Aero Office in the Pentagon was created in 2022 to replace a previous Office of Naval Intelligence, also trying to understand the implications of hundreds of reports of unidentified aerial phenomena that are monitored by Earth humans as performing highly advanced maneuvers that humans cannot do. An example is a UAP UFO traveling at 12,000 miles an hour and then stopping dead, still high in the atmosphere. Before this briefing hearing today, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has been frustrated that during a March 28, 2023 meeting about the Department of Defense budget request for fiscal year 2024, there was no funding for the Pentagon's Aero Office, provoking Senator Gillibrand to say, quote, the lack of full funding for Aero is a significant concern. We need to ensure that our government is taking the UAP issue seriously and dedicating the necessary resources to improve our understanding and response capabilities with unidentified aerial phenomena, close quote. And now I'm going to share with you comments that I received from a military aerospace source after last week's Earth Files podcast. 
quote. Linda, the tall white extraterrestrials do live in the 82G Eridani solar system, 20 light years from Earth. Tall whites inhabit two of at least three planets that orbit the 82G Eridani star, and they are cataloged as Planet 4A2 and Planet 5A2. The tall whites are very intelligent and teach us how to correctly plot stellar points of navigation in deep space quantum tunneling. Tall whites do ally with some Nordic species. There are nine different variations of the Nordic blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pale-skinned race of ETs, similar to the human race on Earth that has Caucasian, Negroid, Asian races of Homo sapien. Some Nordics inhabit the binary star system Procyon A and B, only 11.45 light years from Earth. They also inhabit the binary star system Sirius A and B, only 8.611 light years from Earth. All three USS LeMay, Hillenketter, and Vandenberg deep space craft were built the same, except the Hoyt Vandenberg is bigger to accommodate larger equipment payloads. All three can be offensive or defensive if necessary. Currently, with the help of the Tall White and Nordics, the USS Curtis LeMay and the USS Hillenketter have been to 28 catalog solar systems in our, in our spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, close quote. In addition to my last week's interview with Benji in Melbourne, Australia, about his face-to-face -face physical encounter with a tall white in Sydney back in 1998 during the Leonid meteor shower then. Recently, I also interviewed Bruce Solheim, PhD, now 64-year-old distinguished professor of history at Citrus College in Glendora, California. He was also a Fulbright professor and scholar in 2003 at the University of Tromso in northern Norway. He earned a PhD in history from Bowling Green State University in 1993, and his bio says Bruce was the first person in his family of hardworking Norwegian immigrant parents to go to college. And he served six years in the U.S. Army, becoming a helicopter pilot. His official bio also states, quote, Bruce has been abducted several times, has seen UFOs, and continues to have contact with alien beings, close quote. And one of those alien beings is a tall white featured in Professor Solheim's book, Anzar, the Progenitor, released in 2021. The cover of this book, he told me, was done because the publishing house thought that Anzar should be uh, more mysterious, but that in fact, the dark cloak was for the book cover, and in fact, that this is a tall white as we have seen through uh, previous reports. And that the first encounter that Bruce Solheim had with this being was in 1964, when he was only six years old in Kenmore, Washington, living within a quarter mile of a Nike missile base. Then there were a number of Nike missile bases in a ring around Seattle because of Department of Defense work at Boeing and the Todd Shipyard. Looking back, Professor Solheim says that in 1964, the tall white he first saw was in the form of a three-dimensional hologram in the backyard that warned six-year-old Bruce about a child molester in the neighborhood, and the warning was correct. Three decades later, in 1997, Another holographic form similar to what Professor Solheim remembered from his 1964 childhood encounter appeared again in front of him as a slowly turning 
three-dimensional hologram that was suspended in the air. And the holographic being said that his name was Anzar. When you look up Anzar in Wikipedia or sources, you will find that it is an Arabic word that stands for the Angel of Paradise. During that 1997 holographic communication, Anzar also told Bruce that he was, quote, a progenitor, close quote, implying genetic manipulation on Earth by Anzar's tall white civilization, perhaps working with the Nordics. Now in 2023, both Professor Solheim and Benji in Australia have received telepathic information, both of them, about a dangerous big event that will impact Earth. Now, why the difference of holographic projection for Professor Bruce Soheim, but at least two face-to-face -face tall white physical encounters for Benji in Sydney and Melbourne, Australia? Have you ever stood face-to-face -face physically with Anzar or any tall white? No. No, not physically. It's always in some type of form, some type of either a thought form or a holographic type image. I can tell you this, that recently in my contact with Anzar, we've been talking about what he calls the big event. And there is noticeably, and I'm not the only one noticing this, there's a lot of retro causality going on. There's a lot of weird things going on simultaneously that don't seem to make much sense and everybody seems to be moving in opposite directions and not necessarily working together whether it's here or in the world or wherever what happens my understanding is this big event which is just the part here on earth is just part of a larger story we're just a small part of a much larger cosmic thing that's going on what is the big cosmic event that will impact us well, the projection of the conflict between different alien races has been spilling over onto Earth so that their conflict is causing things to happen here, different sides to be taken. Can you explain this? Because it reminds me of a sentence that was given to me by a Defense Intelligence Agency analyst in December of 1999. He said, Linda... World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies. Is something like that now going on in 2023? Yeah, that's what is about to happen. And it's already rippled back into time. And people who are kind of sensitive to those ripples are picking up on it. I'll give you an example. On 9-11, me and probably a million other people who are very sensitive had terrible nightmares that morning. For me, I didn't see buildings. I just saw the world kind of starting to crumble. It was made of sand and everything was just crumbling apart. And I woke up in a panic. And then a couple hours later, it was 9-11. And that set off a series of events. Well, this big event is much bigger than that because it's not just here on Earth. And that's this retro causality because things move forward and backwards in time. The tall whites can move backwards and forwards in time, and they know then about this big event. Yes. What are the tall whites doing? What have they shown you is going to happen off planet and here? And what are they doing perhaps to counter it? Well, Anzar always tells me this involves what a lot of people in the intelligence agencies would know, that there's a new tripartite pact that is formed, mainly with China and Russia and, and Iran, but they have some help. It's not just them. Like from who? From reptilians, from insects? I'm not exactly sure which alien groups, but they can only help China and Russia and Iran. They can only help them so much. And so the tall whites and those that are supportive of trying to help us have to not only deal with their alien counterparts, but also with the people here on Earth who are being manipulated. It involves nuclear stuff. I've seen imagery in my visions of explosions. I hear them, I see them, I smell them. One time I had a vision of an explosion so powerful that it 
turned the sky into like a rainbow, but the rainbow was a rainbow of radiation emanating from the mountains and destroying the mountains and moving towards us, and there was really no place to hide. Have you seen what you think is a nuclear atomic explosion in the skies of the Earth? Yes. Where? It's in my vision. I was in some type of a military base while this was happening, and there were mountains in the distance, and that's where the rainbow emanations began and then moved like a wave towards us. And this is so beyond what I can really understand. Those are the images that I get. And I hear these things, too. I hear explosions, and like I said, I can smell this kind of odd smell, ionization smell. And the images are so horrific that I want to, like, not remember them. I don't want to acknowledge them, but I do write them down in my journal as best I can. Are you able to lay down at night and say, Anzar, I am seeing a nuclear explosion in the sky of Earth. Can you tell me? If this is going to happen, when or are you and the tall whites going to be able to stop it? Well, I have asked about it, and he always says things like there are many variables. He said you can't always predict when. The best you can do, the best I can do, is to prepare. What specifically has he been showing you? Can you go into details and explain that more? Yeah, what he has shown me in bits and pieces of this big event is that there's a physical war here in this dimension between us and the Chinese, especially, with the Russians helping as well, and Iran, which shouldn't come as a big surprise to people, you know. But that is going to spiral out of control. It's going to start non-nuclear, and it's going to advance as one side begins to kind of fall behind or start to lose, they're going to have the option, the nuclear option. So that is what I'm seeing, and that is what I've been told is going to happen. The tall whites and the ones that are trying to help us are going to try to minimize the ability of the tripartite group that I mentioned. So it will be limited nuclear war. It's not going to be vaporizing the planet or removing our atmosphere or anything like that, but it'll be bad enough. It'll make things unlivable in certain areas. And yet I have been told by the aerospace source that the tall whites have basically promised our government that they will prevent all nuclear events. My understanding is that they can't shut it completely down. There is also such a thing as an accident. Maybe there's not an intention or there's kind of a madman theory that can happen. Or there are nuclear sites like a Chernobyl type of event, could also be devastating as well. But from what I understand, it's going to be more limited. And this idea of free will, the idea that if they protect us from everything and do everything for us, kind of like a parent doing for a child, this is the way it was explained to me, that the child learns nothing. Sometimes you got to let the child get hurt, not killed, but hurt, so they understand what they're doing, so they can learn their lessons. In your book, near the beginning, you have this quote, time is not an arrow, it is a boomerang, close quote. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that and apply it to where we are right now in April of 2023 with the whole planet worried about nuclear war? Yeah, so the idea of linear time versus time like a boomerang comes back, the circular version of time that tomorrow is yesterday and this idea that it's all connected, that everything is happening at once. And our concept is like an arrow, you know, like you shoot an arrow, it goes in a certain direction. But really, it's more like a boomerang because it comes right back around. Has the tall white Anzar used words to you that we, meaning the tall whites, we can manipulate time well enough to stop or neutralize something like a potential nuclear war on Earth because we do not want to see Laboratory Earth destroyed? Well, they're doing what they can, but there is a limitation. And it's not that they can't stop it completely. It's just that there has to be an element of free will. Otherwise, we are under complete control, and that's the problem. That's the dilemma. You know, you have to allow them to make mistakes. 
not let them make such serious mistakes that we wipe out the entire planet or wipe out all civilization. It'll be bad enough. That's my crude understanding. Do you have any visual impressions in your mind about the physical war that is taking place beyond Earth? Who is fighting who in this solar system and in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond? Who, what ETs are fighting each other that it ends up causing war here on Earth as well? It seems clear to me in my experience that the reptilians are, to put it in our terms that I kind of understand this good guys or bad guys or in-between guys, whatever, that the reptilians are not the good guys. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. My experience that I've had with them, they're very powerful and very manipulative and not very friendly and don't seem to have our best interests at heart. So who they're helped by could be, I get this idea that there's some grays that are okay or more neutral, and then there are some that are more along with the reptilians. That's as far as I know. And what is the heart of the dispute among extraterrestrials that is leading up to this huge event that's dangerous? I think it has everything to do with this concept of free will. I think that's exactly what it's about. It's really between having free will or being controlled. And it kind of mimics, in some ways, our own terrestrial version of that. This idea of, do you want a free society or a completely controlled society? And I think even the so-called bad guys think that total control is the way to go, because you don't want humans or lesser creatures, as they might say, to have any free will. It kind of symbolically represented with how our terrestrial world is. There are those that think that a totalitarian system or an authoritarian system is more efficient, is better. And maybe they even think that's right. Maybe they don't think they're wrong. In fact, I know people who don't think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Although every fiber of my being tells me that this idea of love and this idea of free will is extremely important to our soul and to the development of our soul and to our next evolutionary step. Anzar calls it a revelation. He doesn't call it disclosure. He calls it a revelation, which is very internal, very spiritual of our soul, essence of who we are. And so I think that it can be put in very simplistic terms like the forces of light versus the forces of darkness. But what's interesting is that the forces of darkness don't really think they're bad. <laughs> That's the key to the whole thing. They think that that is the way things should be. The Russian government or the Chinese Communist Party or Iran's theocracy, they think that that type of control is what we should have. That is the best model. And what Anzar is implying, that revelation will be that for your souls to survive and be strong, you must live lives that are free. Yeah, and have that balance, obviously, that those that are out of control, that are just exercising their own free will without regard for other people. That's where the love part comes in, to keep love in your heart and always operate from a position of love as a free person. Free will doesn't mean you can go and do whatever you want to other people, because then you're defined this idea of love of self and love of others. And that's the very difficult balance that we all face and that they're, I think, trying to help us in making this leap of consciousness. Not a leap of faith, but a leap of consciousness. Freedom comes with a price. So it's something that you can't take for granted, whether it's here on Earth or, I think, in the cosmos. A free person with discipline is what we're striving for in this leap of consciousness, realizing that where the boundaries are between your freedom of action and somebody else's freedom of action and realizing that where one intermingles with the other, and that's the love part. If the tall whites showed up in front of you physically today, tonight, tomorrow, would you go with them onto their craft? Oh, sure. And you feel an alliance with them? Yeah. Well, it's an integration. That's what Ansar calls it, integration. And it was frightening at first. When I first started, in fact, the shaman who saw Ansar behind me at that meeting I was at talked about an integration. He said, 
that can be a very scary thing, a very dangerous step if you're not sure of who you're dealing with. And I said, well, I am sure because he's been with me for a very long time. So I have a trust. I have a common history and I feel a connection. He was asking about this integration and I was very specific. I said, well, does that mean I no longer exist in my form that I am now and taking care of my family and all that? And he said, no, you're going to continue to exist the integration comes at a higher level of consciousness. That's where it has to happen. And you have the impression that the tall whites move dimensions, that when they're here physically, they're in third dimensional matter, but that they go into other higher dimensions, and that's how they can move around the universe in what we would call seconds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that is not a barrier. And have you ever been with them on a craft, on their craft, when it was doing dimensional leaps? I was on a craft that, and this was another vision, but the craft launched from a military base, and there was somebody in a uniform on board, but I knew it was an alien craft. And I know it was one of the good guys, so it was one of the tall whites or Ansar's allies. But the craft, as soon as we were inside, the walls of the craft, you know, the round walls disappeared and it was translucent. You could see through it. You could see everything everywhere in every direction. And then it started to move, and it moved at this incredible speed, and nobody knew we were even there. Currently, the Federation of American Scientists reports, quote, estimated global nuclear warhead inventories in 2023 are in nine countries that include Russia at 5,889, China at 410, the United States at 5,244, and so far none reported publicly in Iran. May none of us on Earth ever see one of these horrible nuclear warheads exploding anywhere on this beautiful blue planet again. And I now want to share with you an email that I received last night from Benji in Melbourne, Australia. I shared with him some of Professor Solheim's story. And Benji, who is also from Northern European bloodline, emailed back to me, quote, he, Professor Solheim, having a Norwegian background too, and myself, I am sure having Northern European blood has something to do with how the tall whites are tracking people like us down. I am, like you, Linda, curious about those who have had contact with the tall whites. It is interesting that Bruce has ongoing contact that is regular, something that hasn't happened with me yet. But I think more contact will be initiated again when the time is right. Not that I am too worried at this stage. One of the tall white beings said to me on the day that 9-11 was happening in the United States, that my life was going to take some dramatic twists and turns, and it will seem like I am completely alone. But I had to trust that the tall whites would be there even if I could not see them for a time. This war scenario is what we are on the brink of right now. It seems to be a part of our timeline, but the tall whites are attempting to shift the outcome. I don't think that the changed outcome will be a clean, conflict-avoided sort of scenario, but perhaps the tall whites will mitigate the severity of the conflict. Like the double-slit photon experiment, the tall whites might change the outcome by measuring or observing. And now it may seem as if the tall whites have a crystal ball and can see the future that way. But I think of it like psychic math or science. There are metrics that can be applied to future events. AI will be showing us more of that possibility soon, I am sure. If you've ever listened to someone like geopolitical expert Peter Zihan. He talks about geopolitics, and he is someone with the right data set and the right kind of intelligence, 
and they can make startling revelations about our near future based on data and facts. Whether or not I listen to Zehar or to the tall whites, the message seems remarkably similar. The trajectory for human advancement is on a razor's edge right now, before we even get into nuclear disarmament and disposal. We have food shortages coming and supply chain interruptions, leading to famine for large populations all over the planet. We have unstable economic environments and big countries seeking to shore themselves up through resource acquisition. China and Russia are doing this as well as Taiwan and the Ukraine. Even the request for rare earth elements will be on the rise as we all become more of a technological society. We may not even have the resources to continue developing in the way that we have been. This could lead to fewer people having access to greater technology than to others. And then you have the reaction of all of us citizenry who do not have a purpose and are debt slaves in a system that will work you till your dying breath. Riots and unrest will force the hand of governments to send in more enforcement to assert control and authority. The forces and this forces an arms race between governments and citizens facilitating radicalization in the formation of militia and furthering the split between the top and the bottom part of the human populace. I fear the United States is on this kind of path and you can see this playing out on the streets of France today. In short, human beings are angry, disenfranchised, and feel something has been taken from them. Certain parts of the world, they will sell you a gun as the solution to your problems. A little naive to think that more weapons is a solution here. The breakaway civilization has already begun per Rich Dolan's assertions. The most difficult part of this story is the planned obsolescence of humans, the merging of man and machine. So the connections that exist between giants like Google, DARPA, and more broadly, the military industrial complex are of great concern too. This isn't so much about governments as it is about companies and old wealthy families Whoever these elite people are on earth, they are playing a dangerous game. War with the people and potentially war in space with the different ET races, all for power and the consolidation of control into the hands of a few humans on earth who believe they will be able to live that fever dream in space. But the message is getting out and maybe it is the start of a kind of revolution of the mind. Peace in the US, and indeed the whole world, is impossible. But peace inside of you is possible. Ultimately, it is up to the individual to make that choice for themselves. Bless you and the work that you do. Close quote from Benji to me. And bless you, Benji and Bruce, for the work you have done and keep doing. And Ian, I would truly appreciate hearing from any of our viewers tonight who are UFO abductees and have also had recent vivid dreams about a big event coming to Earth. Transition to you, dear Ian. Thank you, Linda. Yes, and we welcome any of our audience tonight to contact us at earthfires at earthfires.com or contact us this evening if you're in the chat and let us know if you've had uh, an experience that shows you a prediction of, uh, or a prophecy of something happening, some large event coming. And I would like to add that I considered for back and forth, back and forth, should I do this program tonight or not? Is talking about the potential for nuclear strike, is it something that should be hidden, suppressed? 
And after days of going back and forth, back and forth inside myself, I realized it is the same back and forth, back and forth, should we reveal that the Pentagon has been doing and the War Office since going back to the 40s. And the answer that seemed so strong to me about three days ago, Linda, if you do not speak the truth and others begin suppressing because they're having dreams that are scaring them or they have information like Benji and like Bruce, <coughs> excuse me, it's Juniper, then we're never ever going to get to the top of the hill that to me seems like it's very important that we should reach it now. That if more and more humans had more and more honest knowledge about extraterrestrials, wars in our universe, our own past, World War II being an extraterrestrial war fought through human bodies, if we just could all get this out in the truth, then it seems to me that what I've experienced myself in the last three days in coming to terms with this was, I realized that I wasn't taking my back and forth, should I, shouldn't I? Is this information too harsh? Is it too, too anything? That I found myself going to one of my favorite windows where the sun shines almost from morning until night and standing there and letting the light go on my face and feeling it almost palpable and saying, dear thought that dwells in the light, please, please help this planet Earth. Please help every human that is here to get past pulling a gun on a mistake of even thinking that there could be an unleashing of nuclear weapons, it's insane. It is insane. And maybe if all of us, every single person on the planet in one second went to the divine field and asked and said, help us, something is in the timeline these advanced beings know that because they can go forward and backward in time. They know that there is something in our immediate future that will be as big as the explosion of a nuclear weapon and that they are trying to diffuse it, change it, modify it, but can they eliminate it? And you and every human on earth may be the only ones that could eliminate. Because if every human mind, like in the slit experiment with photons, if every single human mind of eight billion said to the thought that dwells in the light, however you perceive that, please, please change our future, change every negative, violent force that is trying to develop and become strong here. Get rid of it and replace it with human beings that are concentrating on allying themselves with the light, with beings that speak truth on a planet that needs so badly to change from decades and centuries of lies by controllers. If we're going to survive as a species, this is like one of those huge intersections. We have got to grow up now away from person to person hatred and violence if we're going to survive. And we have got to look at ourselves as a species that is wondrous to some that exist in our Milky Way galaxy and beyond. We are wondrous to them. And we're not wondrous to each other. I hope, I truly hope, 
that my decision to share this particular program tonight is not a mistake. I hope what it does is provoke all of you to want to reach out to a higher force, a higher power that is behind a universe that is 13.8 billion light years in size and could have been generated by another dimension, by another universe, specifically to be an advanced university for training souls to differentiate between the white, the light, the peace, the love, and the dark, and the hatred, and the destruction. And always, always come out of this university, universe, always choosing the light. Benji and Bruce both share a very similar expression to me on these same lines. That's what they're concentrating on as well. And I think sometimes don't we have to go to very serious issues that are often, shh, shh, shh don't talk about it, it's, it's too dangerous, it's, it's too sad, it's too difficult, nobody wants to have to deal with it. But we do. We do. And Ian, if you have anything that you could share from our viewers tonight that they have communicated about what they are sensing, this would be a perfect time to share. Okay, well, first of all, Linda, just Dog says, great program, Linda. Please always come forward with your information. <laughs> Doomsday Diary says, great job, Linda. And Sean Zoltley says, never stop, Miss Linda. But yes, we have got a response from the audience tonight. Denise Siegel says, I am also an experiencer, and I was shown the Russian invasion and later a nuclear weapon used. She also says, also, I have been shown uprisings all over the world. And Sofa Loren, Sofa that Lauren says some of us will be taken. I speak of as an experiencer. Meaning, meaning some people will be beamed up perhaps or physically transitioned that might be like Benji and Bruce Solheim, meaning they have a relationship with some of the beings and that there might be this bringing together where they do have cultivated uh, humans that are very used to them and want to be with them. That may be part of the story, but we also have to address always the whole truth, the whole story, and the whole truth is that on this planet right now, I am convinced that there are non-humans who are hostile and they are working through camouflage they are working through manipulation psychologically with humans to separate us, divide us, to conquer us. And I think that our government and certainly the tall whites and the Nordics, they've been dealing with this uh, for a very long time. And that means that if there is something coming where there would be like a plan, a program for some people to go with some of the beings that they already have a relationship, it would seem sort of natural that that would happen. And it makes you, doesn't it, Ian? Doesn't it make you think of that description in Genesis and a time that would come in apocalyptic times and a person standing next to you on a street would disappear. It, it, it's like the story has been there for a long time, but now we're coming up perhaps to the time when something like this could occur. Yes, uh, some people referred to it as a rapture, and we've often heard from abductees, contactees, and experiencers who tell us that they've been uh, 
shown that they will be participating in this mission to rescue people. And the thing to concentrate on, I personally think, is not to, not to have dogmatic, this is what I was raised, this is what I know, but to be open in spirit and heart and mind, learning as much as you can, and knowing and, and being, I think the, what I'm trying to say is, we are not alone. The universe is filled teeming with intelligences and that we have got to get over, which I have been hoping would happen in April, that there would finally be this announcement, which has to happen also, that we're not alone, that people who are having interactions with very positive beings like the tall whites and some of the species of the Nordics, that they really are uh, in some kind of a collaboration. And that collaboration with extraterrestrials will seem uh, way out there to some people. But from my point of view, Benji's point of view, uh, Professor Solheim's point of view, it's happening. And that, in it seems that the big thing is, we've got to have a fast paradigm shift that moves the whole planet to waking up to the fact that they have never been told the, the truth ever. <laughs> that we, we are the product of genetic hybridization, manipulation, humans are, just like the tall whites, the Nordics, the greys, then there are the big reptilians that are supposed to be so dangerous, and the insects that are supposed to be so hostile that uh, President Reagan was introduced to in that uh, Camp David meeting in March 6 to 8, 1981. So the facets have been there. They've been around us. It's like the picture, though, is beginning to get clearer and clearer. And Ian, is there anybody who has uh, now communicated anything specifically about a current vivid dream? Well, we've got Bug Meany says, I've seen the Japan without people and a massive upheaval of the ground. Japan Hermes without Chris people. Megistus says, repetitive dreams of a major flood to wipe us out. Well, those have come before. They're not specific to a nuclear scenario. In other words, people in the abduction syndrome have been reporting what they call world flood dreams in my work probably for at least 10 years. And that seems to be one facet. Another that I ran into a lot in the 1990s when I was working on my two volume book, Glimpses of Other Realities, volume one and volume two, were so many abductees who were having dreams about seeing the entire sky around the planet. Their point of view was like from outer space, looking at Earth, the way we would look at Earth from the moon. And that all around the entire planet was fire. Uh, there were a lot of, under hypnosis, a lot of people referred to sky fire. Well, is that nuclear? Is that a micronova from the sun? What is it? We don't have clarity. And balancing this out, are you seeing any comments from people so far, Ian, who are talking about how they do feel a sense that if humans would concentrate on the opposite, that any time there is a vivid dream if there is any vivid image that comes into the mind's eye that is about fire or water or whatever it might be, that you counter it by seeing light and asking the thought that dwells in the light to block the fire, block the water, change the future from something in which there would be possibly devastation to something that means we are, re we, that we are in a revolution and sometimes dreams can show what's coming that changes as things that are destructive. But on the other side, it isn't going to be destructive. It's going to be a big change. 
And I'm just trying to find a way that we can have these honest discussions without anybody being afraid that in my goal is make you feel stronger because the more information we have, the more, as the uh, tall white said to, um, I think it was uh, Professor Solheim, prepare. We can't predict precisely because of the way time moves forward, backward, and can be chopped up. But the thing we concentrate on is becoming prepared psychologically, physically, everything. And that's what I'm hoping that we will be able to hear from people who do sense that they are giving, being given information to make them stronger and more aware and that all of us need to learn more. We need to all learn a lot more about what would you do if there was a nuclear explosion off the coast of the Pacific Ocean or somewhere. We are not well educated about these questions. And in the process of getting educated, we might, along with the tall whites and the Nordics, we might diffuse the timeline so that the event is moderated, which is, as I understand, what the tall whites are trying to do. Ian, any other comments here? Lee Siegel says, uh, echoes your sentiments there, says, yes, I do much work and so do others to counter this energy. And I think here we've got uh, another one from Four Claire, who says she dreams of another world every night since about four years now with different customers, for example, like our world, but in a different dimension, really strange and vivid. But she puts this beautifully and says, let's keep on raising our consciousness, yeah. all of us, yeah. all the time, and just concentrate on love for all humankind. Absolutely. Yes. Shout that from the mountaintops. It's also what Benji and Professor Solheim, both of them, about the uh, concentrate We've got to raise our consciousness away from the things that are destroying us and the earth. We have got to find a way to be concentrating our minds, our souls, our bodies on things that are positive, evolutionary, and moving in a direction in which we will survive and we will be stronger. That's what I pray every day will happen. Okay, Ian, any other questions to me from the audience. Yeah, there's a direct question from Cortado Joe who says, can the soul get destroyed by a nuclear war or nuclear explosion? I've heard that before. It goes way back. I know I was working at CNN uh, in 1990 and eight, 1989 and 1990. And that came up in a discussion with a uh, a pilot or a couple of pilots, I remember this, in Atlanta. And uh, as I recall, one of the pilots said to me that they had had a briefing, something about that they knew that we were dealing, and we're going all the way back to 8990, but our government and scientists knew then that we were dealing with extraterrestrial advanced technologies that can move point to point in the universe and that being able to go point to point has to do with knowing how to move through black holes. It has to do with uh, Alcubierre warp drive where you're pulling the space in front of you and you move in uh, a rapid speed and that a lot of the abductees who have had, uh, let's say, physics or engineering backgrounds that I've talked to over the years they get the impression that the physics, they don't understand in all cases what is even making the craft able to go point to point. But it is, from my point of view, a deep quantum tunneling that they are moving in the fabric of the quantum, the quantum fabric of this universe. And that when Various physicists like Roger Penrose and others have talked about the whole universe being a conscious, we'll call it a conscious, conscious 
consciousness, <laughs> a, a huge physical entity that is conscious of all of the interacting, we'll call it minds, that are in this cosmos, that that is an area that the tall whites and the Nordics, they know how to interact. They are working at a level that humans can only do with them. And that whole kind of excitement that out of all of this seeming chaos and we're going through a time on earth, which I think Professor Solheim and Benji, they both see it. Are we going to be on a planet where all humans come under the same fist? There is no flexibility. Everything is controlled. It seems like that would be hell from my point of view. To trying to evolve all governments to as of, by, and for the people. But I understand more and more, better than I ever have in my life, that for that to be a reality, all humans, skin color, race, sex, I mean, it becomes ridiculous that there are divisions and perspectives when every human needs to be educated and they need to be educated in the same evolving information that is important to survive as we continue to go into this century. If everybody were involved in being educated and becoming stronger, it seems to me that the issue of an, a planet of slaves under 28 families in control of Earth, it would be rejected, 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 and it would never be possible. And this seems to be the swirl. We're feeling this swirl all over the planet, the chaos. So, uh, Ian, I would love it if you would put out in the uh, chat request, how many and can you provide, how many of you have a direct communication to what you feel is the consciousness of the universe? I'm not talking about religious boxes. I'm not talking about philosophical boxes. I'm talking about having a palpable sense, a palpable sense of a link to Star Wars, the force, in this universe. And what are the words that you say in your life that you feel connects you and then strengthens you? That would be wonderful if we could share some of what everybody is sharing in their own lives, trying to keep that link to the light strong. Don't you think, Ian? Right, to keep the positive message going and to keep uh, keep our mind focused on the positiveness. There's a, there's a, another message here from Denise Siegel, who had the strange dreams about, she says, first of all, there are also many ET hybrids mixed in to mitigate this dark period. It seems strange, but after this very dark period, there will be a period of healing for the Earth. Yeah, I think so too. I know that Benji thinks so too. I think Professor Solheim thinks. I know abductees who have also decades ago seen starfire or <laughs> starfires, seen the sky on fire, who have seen the water around the planet. And everyone that I ever did a deep interview with, they all said, if we have to go through that on the other side, it might end up being heaven on earth. Well, can we get to heaven on earth without having to go through nuclear war, global floods? I think it's worth fighting for the truth to take the option of not having to go through the bad in order to get to the rational. And I know that I've gone a little bit longer, but we started a little bit later. And my dear colleague, Ian, 
Is there anything else that you want to contribute? Uh, very briefly, I think uh, if we just remind people about the Portal to Ascension conference in San Diego this weekend, uh, yeah. I'll post the links as well in the chat, and they're also at the bottom of our of our uh, notes below the video tonight. Yeah, I leave Friday. I'm very, very uh, cheering about, I'm going to be presenting, I think, a really, really special presentation in keynote with images and sound and all of that. And Ian's going to be there and friends are coming from all over. And this could be in some ways like one of those, the conferences before COVID uh, used to be so joyous and fun and then everything seemed to go downhill and it was difficult. And now I think, Ian, don't we all have that feeling of coming back together at a conference where we're not worried about disease, but what we are going to be excited about are the discussions on these subjects and more in San Diego at Portal to Ascension. Open the door to a higher level. That's what it's about. And on that That's note, right. and you, we'll be having those late night discussions. So please come along, and please yeah. come and say hello and join us. I've seen the sun rise in many of those discussions. So I love you guys. I really do. And I know this was a sort of heavier program, but I hope that you will let me know if you feel this is valuable and that this is what we all need to be concentrating on more and more, to stay in the light and away the dark. I love you. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. Select a language Bind them anywhere. They love and the captions will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.